Good evening, welcome to Naturally Speaking, a special program tonight uh, entitled The Bear Talk. I'm Michael Marsalek, and uh, before I introduce uh, our honored guests, I'll say that this is a live program being broadcast right from the studios here at Missoula Community Access Television, and uh, somewhere approaching the bottom of the hour, we'll be uh, opening up uh, for your phone calls, and um, we'll do that after a little bit. Uh, we've got all sorts of things to talk about, uh, primarily about bears and grizzly bears in general. Our guests tonight are, are uh, Dr. Charles Jonkel, director of the Ursid Research Center, and Walt Derby, grizzly bear photographer and videographer. Welcome. Well, we've got, uh, uh, Chuck, you've brought uh, quite a bit of slides, and maybe we could uh, start right off the bat by uh, going to some of the slides that we have uh, with us and we can continue to talk as we as we look at some of those um, first of all where did these where were these pictures taken were these mostly in Montana or were they around other uh, parts? a lot of these are from uh, Alaska mm -hmm. uh, McNeil River and some other places um, um, but what I like about this series of slides is they they show um, a lot about the bears and uh, I think some of the things that, that make people so attracted to bears. They uh, show the bears working, making a living, and, uh, and doing things that people relate to very nicely. This first slide, uh, I think, is a real good example. This is uh, three, three cubs, and, and they're watching the water. Where, why are they watching the water? Well, their mom's out there fishing. And uh, so dinner's coming, plus, um, You'll notice uh, in the series of slides, the young are very, very attentive. They're good students, and of course their mothers are good teachers, and a lot of their survival depends on, on what they learn from their mother. There's a lot of knowledge passed down from generation to generation in, in the bear species, just like in the human species. It's another, it's another way that we relate to them so strongly and why we're so interested in, in um, what bears are doing. and. Um, and um, how they make their living and such. This, uh, this slide is, um, is just the young ones. Um, here's another young one doing the same thing. Um, that that human-like stance, too, mm -hmm. uh, we relate to that. Uh, we can see the anxiety and the interest of the animal. I use this uh, series with kids a lot, and, and I talk about, okay, uh, look how these bears are, are listening to their teacher, which is their mother. and. Um, and it, and it really seems to turn kids on to, to the idea of uh, how much they are like us and we're like them. Well, and people are fascinated by bears. You know, we, uh, we are in a very lucky place here in, in western Montana that we are in one of the only places in the lower 48 states, with the only place in the lower 48 states really with grizzly bears uh, in this part of the country. And uh, um, people are always fascinated. I think maybe we need to talk too and, and about the, you know, the impact of people on the bears and, and all of those factors that are mm -hmm. so involved. Uh, well, look, look at Walt. Uh, I don't know, I must know him Walt well, pretty close to 20 years now. And it's because of his, his extreme fascination with bears. It's just uh, been an obsession for many years. I came out here 30 years ago because of the grizz. And uh, I run into people at the park, and that's what makes their day, their trip, if they see a grizzly. And that's, you hear talk about grizzly, grizzly all over the park. Mm -hmm. It's. Uh, well, pretty mountains with grizzly. Did you see that grizzly up there? Was he still up there? And, uh... Now, uh, here's another example of what I was just talking about. Um, the cubs are there, real close to mom, learning from her. There's also a lot going on here that people should know and I think like to know. Notice the two bears closest to water. That's a dominant female, and she's at her fishing hole. And, um, the other bears recognize her dominance. The, the mom and the two cubs behind her, um, they want to fish there too, but they're not going to move up and fish until the first uh, female and her young are out of there. And the way they tell one another that is, is the behavior. See there, look at those bears in the back. They're all looking down at the ground, looking away from the other bears. And what they're telling them with that, with that posture is, uh, hey, uh, we're not going to come up there. In fact, we don't even know there's any other bears around. We don't see you. We're just sitting over here uh, passing the time. And that prevents fighting between them. Fighting is costly. They need to be fishing. And uh, 
So they have this social hierarchy, and uh, and they're very explicit in how they communicate with one another, which again was part of the fascination that people have with bears. And um, a good example of the kind of things we should know about bears if we're going to be in, in bear country. They what is the what is the status of uh, of the bears in this part of the country uh, as far as population, as far as what areas that they're uh, primarily in? Obviously, we all know Glacier Park and and even Yellowstone, but you know, what other areas and and what is the current status of the grizzly bear population and and its listing as far as you know endangered species and things like that? Yeah. Well, their status has actually improved some uh, with the passage of the of the Endangered Species Act and then the grizzly being listed under that act as a, as a threatened species, that has given them a lot of protection and spread a lot of management and research focus on the bears that they, that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And, and this is, I think, uh, uh, what's turned the situation around for the bears. Um, agencies are now spending a lot more money on the bears than they used to. Uh, the public is a lot more accepting of uh, of, of good bear management and good bear research, and uh, it, they're a very costly animal to keep, and uh, the cost is in the research uh, costs, which is very expensive, and, and of course the management costs, and who's going to pay for it? Well, you have to have a public that cares um, and wants their money spent for that sort of thing, and, and I think the Endangered Species Act certainly triggered that, but the, 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 the great interest in bears and, and um, and work like you know people like Walt uh, documenting bears and making uh, information available has amplified the interest of people in bears and thereby their their willingness to pay for bears. As the human species increases in number, it's causing less and less habitat for the bears. We're so much like them behaviorally in our food needs and our space needs that we're constantly threatening them with our increased numbers and. Uh, and uh, as, they, as their habitat gets more and more crowded and pinched, the cost in maintaining them goes up and up and up. So we're going to have to like them more in the future if we're going to keep them, because the cost will continue to go up in terms of keeping them, simply because it'll, it'll be a lot tougher job when there's less habitat and there's more people going into um, their habitat in more ways. Well, then you have to work harder at the management and the research is what it comes down to. So where is the, the, tell me a little bit about where the population centers are of, of the bears uh, in, in western Montana and uh, you know, how much have we encroached upon that, that habitat? Well, they were, they were lowland animals, you know, hundreds of years ago when, when this continent was first, uh, before this continent was settled, were they not? And they have been forced into the higher elevations and... That's right. Their, their main areas were the big mountain valleys and even way out on the Great Plains. And they were very uh, abundant throughout the whole western half of North America, and that's all gone now. And that goes back to the, to your previous question: uh, what's their status? Uh, it, it it's gone down, down, down over the years, and it has improved in recent years because of this um, greater interest by the public. A, a curious thing about the, the grizzly, though, is they're part of the brown bear species of the world, and and the brown bears and the wolves were the were the two most widely distributed land mammals in the world. Uh, they, they literally were throughout the northern hemisphere, all across North America and all across Europe and Asia, even down into Africa and places like that. Um, I say were, but in fact they're probably still are the two most widely distributed species in the world. They there still were wolves all across the Eurasian landmass and all across North America. And in big areas, and same with the brown bears. Um, so you can say, well, why are we worried about, uh, about the brown bears? Well, the grizzly is in a different status. The grizzly is a type of brown bear, and especially south of Canada, that's the one we're worrying about mm -hmm. the most. We, we aren't about to lose the brown bears, as you can tell from these pictures. There's uh, some places, there's lots of brown bears. These are grizzlies on McNeil River in, in Alaska, and uh, um, they're just all busy fishing there. And you can see the uh, result of the social hierarchy here where the bears can be quite close to one another without having fights. Each bear there has an understanding with the other bears around it. And they, they all know the rules, they're very strict rules. And again, it's a similarity with people. Um, they have all of their 
social laws and social uh, codes just like we do, and, and they're very polite about them, they're very strict about them, and, and the bears understand them, and, uh, and we should too, if we're going to be around bears. There's a lot of misconceptions about the grizzly bears too, though. Do you want to talk a little bit about, about some of those? And people will have these, you know, varying ideas, uh, some very incorrect. Well, I think one is that uh, they expect to see a grizzly killing things. If they see one, if he's not ripping something up or, you know, guys, uh, nose curled or whatever, teeth showing, they, uh, they think he's a good bear and they think, well, I can walk over and approach him, you know. And uh, any time that I've seen a grizzly and people were able to get closer to him, they did invariably. And um, a lot of people, I say the bear is an awful forgiving animal, and I believe that he is compared to his reputation. Uh, it takes an awful lot uh, for a bear to really do something, and then you hear about it. That doesn't mean you should, you know, be real lax. You, that's probably the biggest danger: is becoming so lax around him that uh, you think that he's going to be safe and nothing's going to happen, and then it can. I've seen him go from standing completely still. You think, boy, it'd be nice to be close to get a picture. To go full gear, just like that, and they can also uh, spring like a. A, uh, a mongoose. They can be sitting right here, and they can be over at that wall just like that. Just yeah, they can uh, move and speed up incredibly fast. Another real misconception about the grizzly is that people look at those big, long claws. They have claws up to four inches long. And of course, they look like knives, and they look like to be great for tearing your insides out. But actually, what the um, what the claws are for is digging. Uh, grizzly bears make most of their living uh, on vegetation. And a good lot of vegetation that they go after are roots, tubers, corms, and such. So I like to call those claws garden tools. It's what they really are. They, hmm. they use them a great deal to get their food and also to stir up the soil, beat out the competing plants that aren't good food, and they plant um, their own species of plants in the process of digging, and, and uh, they literally do a lot of gardening with those front feet. One thing that's really interesting, and that's the eye claw coordination. I've seen them where they just have tremendous coordination. Another thing, the range of power. I've seen them just rip the ground up, just tear it up, and then just start skimming the top, just so gently skimming the very top. So they have a big range of power and good coordination. This whole thing of, uh, of um, bears and people, I think, is very fascinating. And it's not just people, uh, primal people. Uh, you know, primal females had a tough time with the bears, you know, the bears were really big and uh, and uh, they didn't have very good weapons and the bears wanted the same food the people did, so they had a tough time in many parts of the northern hemisphere. Um, and so they have a lot of cultural things and a lot of behavioral things towards the bear, and even religious things. Bears are built into the, the religion of Celtic and Nordic, but also Christian and Islamic religions, uh, a lot of things about bears in uh, religion of people and um, but the curious thing to me is it's still around today by my last count in Missoula there's uh, 28 different organizations they, everything from businesses to clubs and such named after the bear um, which is a remarkable thing I think in a town the size of, of Missoula to have so much focus on the bear but I think we're doing it yet today because we too feel the very the great power of the bear, just like primal people felt the great power of the bear. I was reading an article the other day about a fellow who feels that he can sense a grizz in his travels. He's back country and that he can feel one. Mm -hmm. And he's talked to other people about that. Some people seem to have that ability that they know when he was there. And, uh, mm -hmm. He has a presence, believe yeah. me. Uh, yeah, and, and if you think about, you know, even in European times, there were big cities, uh, pretty good sized cities, or big towns anyhow, um, when a lot of European history was being written. But there weren't roads, and it was quite a perilous journey to go from, you know, from one European city to other. You were going through the forest and big trees and dark pathways and rocky mountain passes, and of course there were bears and wolves there. So mm -hmm. even in... Uh, in recorded historical times, there have been some very powerful influences by these kinds of animals in interactions uh, with the bears and, and people. And, uh, and I, I kind of really fascinated myself, and I like the way we're still so fascinated with bears. And, uh, 
and um, sometimes you know we laugh at primal people but we're doing the same thing ourselves you know why grizzly grocery why grizzly auto well you sell more stuff that way that's why mm -hmm. people know that so that's why they do it can you guys talk a little bit about about what these bears need in terms of of what it's going to take for their continued survival and I think you know maybe even in just terms of what they need just for their daily survival habitat food well, supply and things such as that that's a real crunch where, where uh, especially with the grizzly bear because um, um, they need so much space and in order to get enough food they're big animals so mm -hmm. they need a lot of uh, they need a, a lot of space to get adequate food then they also den for you know sometimes more than half a year uh, which means they have less than half a year to get their food. So food and eating is very important to them, and um, they need a lot of it. And, they're, and then, of course, they're big animals. They use a lot, and then they have to get it stored for the winter. That means they have to have a good habitat, and that's where the crunch comes in. And uh, they need so much area that if you're going to have grizzly bears, you have to keep very large areas fairly pristine. Um, but there again, the people bear thing, um, comes in handy because when it boils down to it, good grizzly bear habitat is good people habitat. Um, take this picture here, you know, all those bears, beautiful river, uh, mountains in the background, um, but there's there's no condos up on that cliff. There's no bridge there. There's no walk along the river. There's not um, tea parlors and such back in the hills. There's not a shopping center back there. And this is what's different about Alaska, and that's why I like this series. Um, because the people aren't there, the bears can be there. Now, the bears were, until man uh, took over to dominate this, uh, this part of, of, you know, all of the, the, the inhabited part of, of this part of the country, um, the bears were the dominant species, right? They were top of the food chain. You know, we are the only uh, things that infringe upon their rights uh, as the dominant species. Is that, isn't that right? That's pretty true. And, uh, and the only thing that was an enemy to grizzly really was another grizzly mm -hmm. and primal man. And um, I imagine it was harder for them to deal with a big grizzly than it was primal man. Um, so, yeah, they were, I sometimes think of them as a primate of North America before, before um, people came mm -hmm. here. They had it their way. and. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of the behavior that, uh, that causes us trouble today is it goes back to, to, that, to that fact. Um, I also sometimes think of us as, as the, uh, the fourth bear in North America, the two-legged bear. And, uh, and, I, and I use that comparison because we're so much like the bears, they're so much like us, and we need almost everything they need, and we, they need almost everything we need. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of competition between the species. And, and it makes uh, it makes a real nice study because it, um, because you can look at bears when you're really looking at people you can be looking and thinking about bears and sometimes it's easier to understand things and accept things about yourself because of that. I like to think that people uh, need more space to survive than a, a lot of part, a lot of countries in the world have. You know. The, the population per square mile. I like to think that people need more space, and they're more certainly more at home in a in a place like Montana. Or I know I am, but uh, <laughs> well, and you I, are. I agree. I, I agree. I don't know what obsesses um, humanity that we want more and more people. Life gets cheap when you have too many people, and it would seem to me we should want more and more grizzly bears because that means there's going to be lots of nice people habitat out there. The way we're going now, you know, we're all going to be standing like that, touching five other people uh, all day long. Is that what we want out of life, or do we want beautiful valleys and, and a, a chance to see grizzly bears uh, fishing and, and things like that? You know, I, I don't know, understand what's going on in, in, the, in the collective minds of humanity. It seems like we're, we're, we're going out of our way to try to ruin our quality of life. Well, I... People also, I think, have a misconception um, that, you know, the bears have enough habitat and that they're going to be just fine. I mean, what is your, what is your prognosis? I mean, it seems that we're really on a crash course with 
the fact that our, our people population continues to grow and continues to grow and we keep you know we keep cutting into the, the habitat that the, the bigger mammals need to survive bears, wolves, lynx, I mean well, the area where Walt's been working is a good example with the railroad and the highway. And yeah, I know it's the North Fork, the Flathead. I met Chuck up there in 1962, and how that's all grown up with homes and cultivated pastures. One thing I noticed up the grain spill up south of Glacier, uh, I saw over 20 different bears there last year, and people looked down there and they said, now tell me that there's a shortage of bears. Look at all the bears down there. That's just a handful that congregated a great food source. And, uh... Uh, the, the thing about the habitat, where they need big habitat, and this is where the crunch comes. A lot of animals can survive quite well with people in a small area habitat or a small area wilderness or uh, fairly limited uh, ranges. Um, bears, because they're so big and because they hibernate and they have to store a lot of food, need big areas, and that's where the rub comes between bears and people, especially the grizzly and people. There's that competition for space, and uh, and of course, as more and more people go, uh, are born into the world, less room there is for bears, and uh, and inevitably we're going to lose things like the bears if we continue on that trend. I think, you know, I've seen bears go for what you might call a morning walk, which is a five-mile walk, just a little joint, just in their, mm -hmm. just a little, uh, recreation for them, rather than their whole habitat, you know, and the whole area that they actually inhibit. And they, you know, they can cover a lot of ground with a normal walk. I've seen them come off the top of a mountain down, side hill down, go back up the top in half an hour more than I could cover in a day. And they don't look like they're moving, they're just going along their normal gait. Well, they go over a rock, but we'd have to go around it. And, uh, and they can really move when they want to, that's for sure. Oh, just, just Big Bear just walking and doing six, eight miles an hour, you know, we'd be running to keep up with them. And of course, they have four legs, which makes it easier going uphill and downhill uh, for them than it is for us. Well, Walt, maybe we could uh, could talk a little bit more about some of the work that you've been doing in, in uh, um, filming um, and working with the bears, especially up uh, near, uh, south of Glacier near Essex where that uh, grain spill was. Maybe you could just tell a little bit of that story and, and we'll uh, show a little of this video too. Okay, well, I uh, went up there my first time in 1989 and there were three spills over that winter and uh, there was a huge, huge bunch of corn spilled and it really was never cleaned up. Uh, in five years, two things have been done. A cosmetic electric fence was put up covered very small area which did no good and then last year the railroad finally cleaned up the uh, spill took 1430 uh, truck loads out now right under those trees right here this here is a hole that I watched the bears dig in all summer started there was just no hole there at the end of the summer they were down a big bear could fit in the hole I saw over 20 different bears there and, uh, this is a nice shot of a bear that's that nice tree, but, but um, you know, you can say, well, boy, that's a nice photo opportunity, but the corn spill has been a real tragedy, and uh, yeah. it finally got cleaned up in 1993, but it, what's sad to me is that it got cleaned up four and a half years late. Uh, there's probably been about uh, 60 bears that either are dead because of the corn spill, or they're going to have shorter lives. They're, they're doomed because of bad behaviors they learned at the corn spill. And of course, uh, if they could clean it up in 93, they could have cleaned it up four years earlier. And this is what makes me so angry about the whole thing, that um, if an individual would do something like that, you know, everybody and his brother in government would be down in your case. Because the railroad did it, they got away with it, literally. And uh, have caused the, the, the premature deaths of maybe up to 60 bears. And um, a terrible tragedy. It cost them a lot to, to clean it up. And they, and they did a good job of it, but why in God's name didn't they do it four years ago? That's Excuse me, thinking. Chuck, here, uh, these bears almost got hit. There's a train coming. You can't get the full, full benefit, but you will see the train come, and it was close, a lot closer than it looked. They just hit the track, there's the train. They just got off the track. And I saw many close calls up there. I just have to be able to catch this one. Quite a few of the animals were uh, 
were actually hit by trains and, and uh, you know, in addition to all of, all of the other things. I mean, it's, it's obviously a real tragedy. This is just another example of, of um, you know, we're right in the middle of, of prime bear habitat mm -hmm. there. We're running the, the rail line through and unfortunately a spill like that if you notice here, the bears just stay right there. The train, that train's about 30 feet from them. And uh, they just, most of the time, they just lay and look up at the train. And they were always, in this area here, almost always within uh, 50, 60 feet of the tracks. And see, a lot of these are females with cubs. And of course, they have now taught their young to come to this site. And bears are real creatures of habit. They'll return to those sites Excuse even me. if there's no food there. Uh, this male here was a bear that was killed on the highway a couple of months later, about a hundred yards from that exact spot. Uh, yeah, they even carrying on their <laughs> their uh, breeding activity right by the railroad yeah. track, which which is bad for the bears. That that tells you that they've learned bad habits, staying near people, staying near the highway. This bear that we just saw, some people believe he's the one that was relocated last week. That 800-pound bear. I named him Goliath. I had names for all the bears. So how much time did you actually spend there? I Walter? spent about three months up there, total time. I had a camp about a half mile down. And, uh, why, why Walt's footage is so important? It was his footage really that made the railroad finally act. And Walt did it on his own, just through his passion for bears. Nobody asked him to. In fact, the Forest Service tried very hard to prevent him from documenting what was going on there. And they were supposed to be the lead agency in cleaning up the corn spill. And in fact, they, they constantly uh, protected the, the Burlington Northern. And um, that's the reason Burlington Northern got away with it for four years. If Walt hadn't on his own gotten this footage uh, and blown them out of the water, I don't think they would have cleaned it up in 93. We'd still have bears coming in there. And uh, the young, the females went young, especially bad, because then you got a whole new generation that learned bad habits coming to that site. And they'll continue to come. That's why I say it may doom up to 60 bears over time, because there's going to be bears maybe two or three generations later who are going to be coming here because their great-grandmothers came to the corn spill. And they'll get hit by trucks or, or trains. I think there's a, um, down the way there's a campground, a Forest Service campground. And in 89, these bears were a lot closer hang out a lot closer to that Devil's Creek campground. And they were going through the campground every night, and I really expected something to happen there. And I was talking to an employee of the Forest Service, and I said, would you like to see some videos of uh, the bears going through this campground the other night? And she said, I'm sick of the spill, I'm sick of the bears, I'm sick of everything. And um, But uh, I thought there'd be a problem there. They finally did close the campground for the rest of that year, and I think the next year. Is this line also Amtrak line, or is it just yes. to Northern? Yes, it's Amtrak also. Uh -huh. yeah, Amtrak is involved in it now, too. Now, bears have always been coming to the rail line there, because there's always been a little corn and other grain spill, and there's always been some sewage dumped. But what was bad about the corn spill is we've got a lot of bears coming there, and Amtrak is involved in that they kind of constantly spread garbage uh, along the track as they go through. And um, bears will come to a, uh, a, an odor reward just as well as, as to a, um, a food reward. And, and this is where we think Amtrak uh, really has to change its policy too. Now the, 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 the freights change their policy and, and the railroads are not likely to have as many corn, uh, spills there and wrecks as they did, but um, Amtrak is, is continuing to contribute to the problem. I uh, heard today that uh, the superintendent is highly concerned about the uh, the Amtrak. I didn't realize that, and apparently it is a big problem. Well, I think the the main thing that that seems to be the the greatest impact is probably the bad habits that have been learned, isn't it? Yeah, and here again, where bears are like people, they almost have what we call in human societies an oral tradition, and with human beings. You, from listening to your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, your neighbors, passing on information. That's how, you know, human society developed. And, and bears do a lot of that. They don't talk about it, but they, they watch, like you saw in those slides earlier, the, 
the cubs, you know, just watching so intently what the, what the moms are doing. And so they learn from, from their moms, who learn from their moms, and this is passed down who knows how many generations. I think a problem too is the bears are habituated. I mean, a lot of times I was there, there was no one there. And then other times there'd be a bear jam, there might be a couple hundred people there. And the bears would walk right, right by him without any, no, no fear at all. I could tell if a new bear came in, he'd be real jittery and uh, nervous. But most of them just took it in stride. I want to tell you, you are tuned to Bear Talk. This is a live broadcast of Naturally Speaking. Uh, our guests are Dr. Charles Jonkel, director of the Ursid Research Center, and Walt Derby, a grizzly bear photographer and videographer. And we're taking your calls live at 542-6228, 542-MCAT. We do have a caller standing by. Let's try to take the next call here. Caller, are you there? Yes, I am. And uh, go ahead. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering if you gentlemen could address um, the implications of the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act on grizzly bear habitat and what Pat Williams um, proposed Montana Wilderness Bill would mean for grizzly bears. Good question. We've got legislation being proposed uh, right now, and what would that legislation do to, to grizzly bears? Yeah, I could take a whack at that. Um, both the acts, I think, will help the bears because they both are creating more secure grizzly bear habitat. Um, obviously, the NARIPA, the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act, would would protect a lot more of bear habitat, and uh, that's why I've been quite interested in that act. Um, I call it actually I call it bear wolf wilderness because mm -hmm. what it would do would be create big wilderness. Well, we're always creating a little bit more wilderness here and there. Some wildernesses in some of the flatland states are really quite small, but they're great wildernesses, and uh, I don't begrudge them that at all. We need that kind of wilderness. But if we're going to have things like grizzly bears and, and caribou and uh, mountain lions and such, then we have to have big wilderness, and that's basically what NARIPA is all about. Uh, it creates bigger blocks with corridors. Uh, if we're going to have species like this in the future, we've got to act now. And the easy way to see what's needed is uh, you can do it yourself, what I call the 50-year test. What is Western Montana going to look like in, in 50 years from now? Well, basically, I see one city like Seattle, Tacoma, um, Portland, Vancouver, and the West Coast. It's going to be a city literally from Whitefish to Darby, and Polson's going to be maybe 15, 20,000, Missoula maybe 180,000. Kalispell, 90,000, places like Sealy Lake, 5, 6,000. Um, do we have enough habitat to keep the grizzlies with that kind of people, that, that kind of numbers of people? And obviously we, we don't have now, and that's why we need to act now. If we want bears 50 years, 100 years from now, we've got to act now. And, and uh, that 50-year that test, I think, shows you very clearly what we need to do. Is it a matter with this legislation that's proposed of definitely setting aside uh, areas other than, you know, mountain peaks and, and small chunks? Um, you know, you mentioned corridors. Uh, it's obviously uh, these areas of prime habitat, if, uh, if isolated, don't do a whole lot of good either, right? That's true. And the panda in China is a good example of what happens if you don't do that. The pandas are down to very few in numbers and they're, they're isolated in about, uh, I don't know, somewhere seven to nine different small populations. Each population then has to make it on its own. It's very much more difficult for a population to survive if it's low in numbers and limited in size. And, and um, it balkanizes their habitat. And, and uh, that's a real danger for animals that need big areas. And, and Narifa would, would do that with these quarters. Uh, this kind of habitat hasn't been protected adequately in the past. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of nice mountain tops protected and such, but bears can't live in the mountain tops year round any more than people can. They need to come down in the valleys and they need to go from one mountain range to another. And we haven't provided for them uh, that kind of habitat. And if we are going to, we, we probably better do it now because 50 years from now, it's going to be impossible. It'll be too late. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Colin? Uh, yes, it does. I was wondering also um, if what what exactly the release language in the Pat Williams uh, Wilderness Bill 
would mean for the grizzly bear. It seems like so much land is released, and uh, some of that is prime grizzly bear habitat. Well, the part of that I would re worry about the most is that in that release we would lose these corridors. We would lose some of these low elevational areas that the bears need to, to need to go to. And you're literally going to have more situations like the bears along the railroad. And they're nice bears, they're beautiful bears, but, um, but they're doomed bears because um, they're both coaxed and forced into marginal habitat like that. And they learn bad habits towards people and eventually they get dead. Sure. How about the drilling on the Badger 2 medicine? Um, that seems to be a major corridor between the linkage of grizzlies in um, the Bob Marshall and Ian Glacier. And if, if um, the drilling started there, what would that mean for the grizzly bear? Well, that's a different kind of a corridor. That's a north-south corridor. And, and, and the main uh, value of that north-south corridor is it links bears in the Glacier Waterton area to, to bears farther south. Uh, we've already got an isolated population down in Yellowstone, and, and if we uh, get isolated populations in places like the um, Mission Mountains or some parts of the, the um, Bob Marshall or Scapegoat and such, it'll just be bad for the populations. And, and protecting um, the north-south corridors are just as important as protecting the corridors between mountain ranges. This has been a hard thing for, I think, for the public and even the agencies to understand the need for those corridors, but uh, people who know large, large mammals know that we've got to do that, and we've got to do it now. Um, if we want the grizzly bear, and of course the Endangered Species Act says we will keep the grizzly bear, so we're bound by our own laws to do things like Naripa too, and get right down to it. Okay, thank, thank you, you very Colin. much. Thank you very much. If you'd like to call and participate, the number is 542-6228, 542-MCAT, and we are taking calls. Uh, this is a live program. We've got uh, bear experts right here. We've been looking at footage um, of this Burlington Northern um, spill uh, from uh, a few years ago now. And uh, Walt, did you want to add anything more to about uh, some of the footage that we've been looking at here? Um, this here just really sums up all the activity. Uh, there have been a lot more close, close calls than there have been deaths. I know a number of people have almost hit the bears on the highway. And uh, some of the authorities were surprised when I told them that the bears were on the road. Around, they didn't really uh, apparently realize that. They weren't just up on the tracks, they were on the road in the stream, um, around some of the buildings, the houses there, down the way. See, they get used to people, they get used to the odors um, from, from the trains, and then there's, of course, a lot of traffic on Highway 2. People park there, and uh, all this adds to uh, deteriorating their, um, their natural behaviors. Mm -hmm. There's been bears that have come from as far as 50 miles away and come to the corn spill, and um, then they got some bad behaviors. They take that back with them, and uh, so if you look at at that, you know, the corn spell was really a quite a small area, but but um, the, the, the population that it impacted is about 50 miles in uh, diameter. There was no fighting there. There was just so much food. They all got along really well. And I feel that some of these bears were so habituated that you could have walked right up to them if you were stupid enough to do it. I don't think it would have bothered them at all. And, uh, and that's not a good kind of bear to have yeah. right in Glacier Park and right along the highway. And still we let it, we let it happen and that's, uh, to me that's very sad. Um, under some situations, like um, up at McNeil, people, uh, they have places where people can do that sort of thing. There too it causes an uh, habituation, uh, but um, there what the state is trying to do is, is, is literally um, have people and bears interact as one species. Uh, people have to understand the bear's behavior, and the bears very quickly understand people's behavior, and they have a respect towards the photographers, uh, same way that the fishing bears that we looked earlier, where the one family group wasn't messing with the other family group, and that's exactly what goes on between bears and people. I think there's a good lesson in that. There's a lot for us to learn in that. There's also some in danger, though, when it's not explained properly. If you just put a picture like the one here on, 
into a magazine don't tell what's going on and how it's controlled and how people are taught and the real dangers that you can have in a different situation, then that's a bad picture. Mm -hmm. If you explain it and show what the relationship is between the various and the people, then it's a good picture. So it's how it's used, too, is very important. Mm -hmm. You know, keeping a clean campus and everything, you don't put your camp in the center of a grizzly population. Uh, one day I was watching this female, there two cubs, she was on the tape, and three-tenths of a mile down the road, there's a little pull-off area and a little waterfall in there, and there's a fellow on a motorcycle in an ultralight tent. And she was three-tenths of a mile from him, and she's walking that way. She had crossed there that day before. So I stopped, and I talked to the guy, and he said, uh, I have no authority, but I thought I'd let you know that you're right in the center of a lot of grizzly bears. And I said, there's a female, there are two cubs coming down this way. And he said, well, I don't have any food. And I said, well, it's not really a matter of any food. It's just that she crossed here yesterday, and she's coming down this way right now. And he said, where should I go? And I suggested another place. So anyway, I went back to my camp. I came back an hour later. He was still camped there. And the next morning, uh, early in the morning, I saw him packing up. And there was no way. There's no, no way I'd want to walk down that highway at times, let alone be camped right there. But... Uh, it's more than just, you got to use common sense too, besides keeping a clean camp and, uh, and that. These this things that go on between bears and people are very, very powerful, and, and we have to understand more about it and, uh, and uh, be more understanding. The bears understand people and relate to them better than people relate to the bears. Even though we have lectures and slideshows and videos and everything, the bears learn it quicker than the people do. It's really quite amazing how, how good they are at behavior with people. Mm -hmm. This, of course, again, is it in Alaska, it's not in Montana. Our bears are different. Uh, they don't see as many other bears, they don't have as many social skills, and so you really wouldn't want to do things that you can do with Alaskan fishing bears. Even though they're the same species, these bears around here are quite different behaviorally, and that's why it's so, um, so important to explain the difference when you're giving slides and, or publishing pictures and such. That a lot of time isn't done adequately and adds to the problem. Explain what's going on in, in those different situations because it could be misinterpreted. That's right. Let's take another call here. Good evening. Hi, um, I had a question for Chuck. Um, I've heard that grizzly bears are an indicator species for other animals and the general health of the ecosystem in general. Um, are there declining populations, um, you know, the overall trend of their decline? Is that sort of a sign to us that we really need to pay attention to the issue and protect um, the species for the, you know, general health of the ecosystem in general? Well, I, I think grizzly is a very good indicator species. A lot of other species are, too, things like wolverine, pine martin, and such. Um, probably just as more so, but the thing that's different about the grizzly bear is that we are so interested in the grizzly bear. And, of course, they can hurt us, and, um, and um, we're more frightened of them. Um, but... Um, Basically, what it boils down to, an indicator species, um, um, is healthy for people. Um, if you've got wolverines and caribou and um, grizzly bears around, you've got some really nice people habitat. And, and um, so we're automatically taking care of ourselves when we're taking care of things like the indicator species. That's the logic behind it. And I think the grizzly is really important. Um, <laughs> Thank you for calling. And we welcome your phone calls. We've got a little bit of time left. The number is 542-6228, 542-MCAT, and this is a live program, a special naturally speaking program entitled Bear Talk. And with me is uh, Walt Derby. He's a grizzly bear photographer and videographer. And uh, Dr. Charles Jonkel, director of the URSID Research Center. Uh, what, what do you guys think of this um, theme park attitude that seems to be coming into to the grizzly bears and maybe even some of the some of the things that have been happening with the I know a, a grizzly bear park of sorts has opened up near near uh, Yellowstone um, I'd like to say first a word about these two two bears here sure. um, to me this is one of the most powerful pictures of bears I've ever seen and people relate to that in all sorts of ways visual ways but all sorts of subliminal ways um, what are the bears seeing? Uh, why are they standing like people are standing? Why are they so intent? What's going on in their in their heads? And, and set that. I think the stance, the uh, 
the curiosity is very, very powerful. And to see wild bears out there doing their thing, you know, we're spying at them, we're being voyeurs here. Here's these two young bears learning about the world. Uh, what are they learning and how are they learning? What does it mean to them? And what will they pass on to their young uh, in the way, ways that we do? I think that this is a real good example of, of this bear people relationship. The, the, um, the zoo you're talking about, I prefer to call it a roadside zoo. Um, at West Yellowstone. I, I, I'm appalled that the state approved that. I'm appalled that the other the agencies have gone along with the, uh, with the idea. I know there's been a lot of opposition um, in, um, in West Yellowstone and, and in the area, but, you know, it's happening. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very bad for the bears. I think it's bad for the people. Maybe it's good for the economy of a few people, but it'll be fairly minor. Um, they're cloaking it in an educational experience. In fact, it's going to educate people, I think, the wrong way. People are going to be, um, think they, they're going to think they saw bears in Yellowstone Park. They'll, they'll forget that they saw them in a roadside zoo. And the way the zoo is set up, you can get pictures uh, of yourself with bears immediately over your shoulder without showing the fence and without showing the moat and such. Mm -hmm. To me, any little educational aspect that they might gain through their program is all going to be washed away just by the very, very harmful photos that will be taken there. Mm -hmm. How many bears do they have in captivity and what is the... I mean, this is obviously just a, uh, an opportunity for, for the novelty effect of, you know, people going to the park area to see bears and and then you have the chance of, yeah, I saw the bears, but in fact, the bears are in captivity. And what, what is this, the exact circumstances there? Well, Do you it's know? not, yeah, it's not bear habitat. Um, people will get the wrong impression of what bears need. Um, they'll uh, will think they've seen a grizzly bear and they won't. They'll have seen a zoo bear. <coughs> a zoo somewhere else I can, I can live with, near cities and such where people have nothing else, but to have a zoo right next to a national park, to me, is absolutely obscene and, and falls in the category of poaching. Um, the person who's going to make a lot of money is poaching bears, just as sure as the guy who shoots a bear illegally, in my, in my mind. I think it's a very vile um, crime towards a bear to allow that theme park and, to, and for the people to promote it as something good. It's not. This little bear is fun when I always tell people that this is a different kind of a grizzly bear that you can call a flying grizzly. And, uh, <laughs> he goes up and down the river till he sees a fish and then bounces on. That's a beautiful picture. Actually, of course, he's leaping on his animal. Well, we do have time for a phone call or two. If you'd like to try to call us, we just have a few minutes left in the, tonight's program. And. Um, You want to talk a little bit more about uh, bear and people interacting? You know, I think that it keeps coming back to that for me because I had a uh, unique experience up at Mini Glacier here in August. A friend of mine is co-producer of a movie for National Geographic. There was an adolescent bear there that was going down the river, and then people were stopping. You couldn't get back across the road to go up where he wanted to go, so they closed the highway, and the rangers let us stay in to take and film him. There's myself, Ron, and behind us some of the executive rangers. And anyway, the bear started coming up the bank, and the ranger said, all right, you guys, he's coming up the bank, get your escape plan. Well, anyway, he did, and he ran down below us at 30 feet by us. But the whole deal, the tension, waiting for the bear to come, for a while we didn't know where he was at, and it was the bear, the photographers, and the rangers all separated in time and space, just an isolated group within the distance, people watching, all right there. Mm -hmm. And the, the tension the, the, at that moment, it was something that was uh, really unique. And uh, we felt we were all one. We were all uh, part of that interaction there. Mm -hmm. A fascinating opportunity. Um, it was, yes, it was. Let's take another call here. Go ahead, caller. Yeah, I'd like um, you folks to address the issue of the mandatory use of food containers in Glacier National Park and Yellowstone National Park. Uh, they do it in Denali, and it works quite well to minimize impacts between humans and bears. And I wonder why Glacier and Yellowstone don't do the same. Well, they are doing it to a much more limited sense. They, 
Mount Washburn area in Yellowstone is, is uh, people, attention is called to that. You can, they're told how to do it the time of the day and they can go and park there and watch bears without really impacting the bears at all. Um, they have a nice visual, long distance view of the bears and can watch them for extended periods right from the safety of their car and the um, secure area of the, of the highway, which just like at McNeil, the bears know that the two-legged bears are up there and they don't come up there and, uh, and the two-legged bears stay in their cars. Um, there's uh, some, some attempt at starting this in Glacier too at some of the pullouts where the bears, especially in the spring, are quite visible. Uh, from the pullouts up on avalanche chutes, and uh, I think there's some great opportunities for that in Montana, and I would like to see, um, I'd like to see the agency spend more time and money in developing that and teaching people how to do it in, uh, in a safe way that doesn't impact the animals. There's some real opportunities in Montana for that. Mm -hmm. It's a shame that up at the spill, there was one side of the road, if people would have stayed there and they could have kept people, which it would have been impossible in a short range thing to set it up. But I always feel that the more people that can see a bear, a grizzly, the more support the uh, bear is going to have. And uh, Yeah, I love it when there's a, a visible grizzly out on an avalanche chute and sometimes 40, 50 people at one of those avalanche chutes. Because you don't know who the people are. They're from Iowa, they're from Washington State, they're from Texas, they're from Europe. But they're all taking home a trophy, their own bear in their own mind. And this creates clients for bears and a lot of support for bears. And I love it when that happens. And I, I think uh, Parks can and should do more of that, uh, learn how to do it. Alaska is no doubt leading the way, I think, for the world in how to do this. I think the state of Alaska has been very progressive in that. There are some dangers, there are some problems, but with research and testing and, uh, and trying this and trying that, I think you can get a, a quite a workable system. We well, have so many people um, in, those, in the park situations especially, and millions of people traveling through and, and all of the, the extra things that that creates, you know, the, the refuse and, the, and the, 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 all the campsites, you know, mm -hmm. that obviously are attracting bears, so there, there is a real fine balance, isn't there not? Is yeah. there not? That, that we have to maintain in those situations. You know, is there going to be a point where the, you know, have to limit the number of people that go to the national parks even because of the impact? Of, who knows? I was really impressed the way the uh, park handled the people at Money Glacier this year. Earlier in the year, with some black bears that were along the road, and then with the grizz, it was over three different days that I'd seen this big grizz there. And I think they really did a good job as far as letting people be exposed to see the bear, but yet they protected the bear blocked it off so he could go where he wanted, and it was a real good thing. Um. It takes time to learn how to do those things, and, uh, and certainly some research to know how to do it right. And I think, I would personally, I would like to see both of the parks spend a lot more time in developing um, those techniques. I, I think it would, it would be very beneficial for the bears in the long run. They'd have more clients. But, you know, there's millions of people come to the parks in Montana, mm -hmm. uh, and a good percentage of those come because they might see a grizzly bear, right. or they couldn't in Colorado or whatever. So it's very important to the state's economy. In fact, I gave a talk called uh, the $500,000 grizzly bear. And this is a visible grizzly bear that people might see. And I think that's about what they're worth to the economy of, of the state of Montana. Uh, I just w wish more people would realize it, and people in the agencies would realize it. The people that don't know I'm involved with bears that I'll meet, and I hear I'm from Montana, have you ever seen any grizzly bears? Or uh, if I've come down from the park, I was just up at Glacier, did you see any grizzly bears? Mm -hmm. Not, did you see any goats or elk? Did, did you see any grizzlies? Yeah. You know, I was through there in 1954, and we saw a big grizzly, you know, people will say. And people, that, that really makes their trip when they see that grizz. They, they, that's something that really stands out. Well, didn't I hear something recently about uh, proposals to cut back the number of uh, full-time wildlife biologists in the park system, or something along those lines? Well, it's unfortunately, those, all too often the cuts come from that, you know, the scientific staff and, uh, and, the, and the people who are specialized, you know. There's a number of the national parks that have a, a very high need for bear specialists, and they don't have them. Denali in Alaska is a really good example. They, They've got a, a very explosive and, and, and delicate situation there with a lot of people mixing with a lot of bears. And some years there's nobody in the whole 
park that has any training in dealing with bears and people, and especially the bears. And that's too bad, you know, because sooner or later then something bad happens and the bears get a uh, bad reputation for literally for something people did. Well, the, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier about the misconceptions of the bears, I mean, they, uh, while there is certainly a, a uh, large fascination in people coming to, to the, uh, uh, the national parks and that to try to see the bears, there's also a real, a real fear and people have no idea and they think that, uh, that the bears are, you know, out there killing cattle all the time and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, really seriously threatening the lives of of people all the time, and mm -hmm. really, that that the people bear um, confrontations don't happen that often, and uh, primarily because we are lucky enough to not have to venture into their habitat. Is that is that right? Well, partly because the bears are so polite to us too. Mm -hmm. They, yeah. you know, by and large, bears understand us a lot better than we understand them, and and uh, which is kind of ridiculous when we've got television and books and lectures and slideshows. But to, the bear has to know about the two-legged bear because, you know, we're the super bear. We can hurt them very easily, and they're quite aware of it. So they try real hard to learn more about us and how to live with us. The interesting thing on some of the close-up stuff, I've had bears walk by me. I would never approach them at this distance, but they've walked me by me. And people say, well, did they know you were there? And I said, well, yeah, but, you know, their eyes never looked over. Mm -hmm. uh, no eye contact by the bear at all. He just walked by just like I wasn't there. Yeah, they pretend they don't see you, just right like now. those bears were pretending they didn't see the uh -huh. other bears at McNeil. Let's take another call. Good evening. You're yes, I have a question for Chuck. Uh, I was wondering, to what to what effects do grazing have on uh, grizzly bear habitat? And do grizzly bears actually kill cattle very much, and how do they affect the ranchers? What I don't know much about the conflict, but I understand that it's a big issue in Montana. Well, it is a big issue, but to a pretty good extent, probably a false issue. Bears have a far worse reputation than they than they deserve. Most bears are um, just almost total vegetarians, and bears as a species are, you know, they make their living on vegetation. Very few of them know how to hunt and kill uh, ungulates, including cattle and sheep, which are pretty easy really for them to hunt and kill. Most bears just don't know how to do it, and never learn their whole life. A bear that does learn can be very effective, of course, in killing cows and sheep, and uh, so we don't want that to happen. But by and large, it's um, it's distorted. But you know, it's it's real, even if it is distorted, and uh, so we have to to prevent it as much you know as possible, and and do something about it. The Great Bear Foundation will, in fact, compensate people who have livestock losses to kind of diffuse the situation. But most of the bears don't contribute that at all, and they, they never will. Um, they're out looking for dandelions, not cows, and um, and we ought to know that about them uh, a bit more. It's uh, quite crucial if we're going to keep them that we understand that. Thank you for calling. Yes, I have another question. Is uh, we're just about out of time, so. Okay. Um, I I know that uh, bi bears are migratory to some extent. Um, when do you encounter uh, a problem bear and? Uh, for example, for killing cattle or bothering somebody in the park or something. I understand a lot of times they're relocated either to heaven or elsewhere. Um, do the bears come back and where are, or where are they relocated to? Well, a lot of times there isn't a good place to relocate them, but uh, they'll get moved. Uh, a lot of times they take the problem with them. We'd be far better to try to keep them right where they are and fix it. Thanks. Thanks to Charles Jonkel and Walt Derby, you've been tuned to Naturally Speaking, a special program on Bear Talk.